Welcome to the fourth annual Northern California Summit on Children and Youth. We will look at ways to connect the needs of our communities to the interests and resources of potential donors, our supporters, and of organizations working for change in our region. We believe that we have a role in this, and part of that is to bring speakers like this to our community so that we can really be on the cutting edge of this work. I want to start out with a quote. Um, this is a quote by Frederick Douglass, who uh, was the great abolitionist, and he said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Their health is our health as, as a human family. Their dreams are our dreams as a human family. Their joy is our joy, and their pain is our pain. We have the mission of lessening that pain. Imagine how we can continue to reduce violence if we do more and more and provide more love and embrace all of our children from day one of their precious lives. That, I know, is why all of you are here today. So welcome to the innovative city of Richmond. We address the root causes of our problems here. Uh, in this day and age where uh, our public agencies look like they're going to be spending all of their money on uh, retire, retirees, pensions, and health benefits, and not going to have enough money to actually address the social issues of the day. And when a lot of philanthropy uh, seems to be decreasing, uh, I think this idea of actually investing, uh, perhaps profitably, uh, in good deeds and in social programs and improvements is very exciting and perhaps the paradigm for the future. I also relish the opportunity to continue working with each of you on the issues most important to the lifelong success of all our children. Sincerely, George Miller, Member of Congress. Thank you very, very much for this opportunity. And George will be back in the district um, ongoing and working with each of you. Please keep our, our number um, on your speed dial. And uh, any way that we can help, we want to be there. Thank you. Bye-bye. This isn't a tension between we're either for profit or we're not for profit. This is hopefully a middle ground between the two that allows us to do both things sustainably and better. So if we can get profitable businesses, they can grow. If they become very profitable, they do something that the businesses hate, but that all of us in the social service sector like, which is they attract copycats. So now you have two people trying to do it, or three, or four. And so you have competition, which then produ produces even more social benefit. People have a lot of assets. I mean, in the United States, there's $33 trillion in total assets that are being invested in all kinds of things. And if you're going to have to invest those assets anyway, why not invest them in something that is going to have a positive social environmental impact? So the key is, how do you do it? How do you attract private investors to invest in the social good? That's what this is about. Every improvement in social value equates to economic value. Everything you do not only leads to social benefit, but to economic value for somebody. The problem is that we in the nonprofit world and in the government world haven't taken credit for it. We haven't taken credit for it. We haven't used it to finance ourselves. And that's what this does. If you're a social service provider, this is the way of the future. Um, it's not going to overwhelm philanthropy and government grants, but philanthropists and government grantors are looking at outcomes today more than ever. So this is establishing a new pattern. If you don't know what your social outcomes are, and you're not thinking about how you can monetize that and know what kind of return you're getting, you're falling behind. So really increasingly, we need to be thinking about how we increase our performance tracking data. You know, can we increasingly talk about the impact that our programs have? Can we collect data on how many people we serve and how successful we've been in achieving the mission that we set out to achieve? So the incentive is to work with harder people. So the, the beauty of this model is that it incentivizes the right thing. It incentivizes nonprofits to work with harder people, whether it's healthcare uh, cases, whether it's workforce, whether it's poverty, whatever the area, because the incentive is 
that one can earn more than if they work with either cases. And it's just the opposite of the way things work today. There are no rules to this thing yet. You know, it really is a contract that is negotiated between the parties at the table. I think government officials are intrigued not only because they might save money, but because they're a little bit, um, some of them are increasingly concerned that they're not able to sort out which service provider is doing a good job and which isn't. And so a lot for them is, lo is less, almost less about the cash savings than finding somebody in the middle who will start holding people accountable. And that's a big appeal to busy government officials. You want this to succeed. Everyone wants this to succeed. So who funds that independent evaluator? These are really some meaty questions. And I think it's easy for us to pick on the imperfections in this new innovation, um, you know, that it could be politicized. And as Steve said, anything can be politicized. I think we need to, though, keep in context the relative benefits and evolutions of this model and the fact that it will take time to perfect and work out the kinks. And so as we look at all these issues today and say, we're all behind kids. We, we have a, a number of, of policies that are clearly needed to make sure every kid has a chance. We say, wow, we've got a problem here. We've got great, f fantastic organizations. Each of you out here represents probably multiple organizations. But when it comes for advocating at a broad scale for needed changes in Sacramento and DC, kids don't have a voice. And so even though there's a lot of consensus behind needs to get done, it doesn't happen. So here in California, we come up with a simple but incredibly powerful response to that problem. The problem being thousands and thousands of kids related organizations, great support for kids, but doesn't get translated into a kid's voice in Sacramento. And that is, let's connect all those voices. It's called the Pro Kids Children's Movement. You have some information at your table, and it's very simple. You as an individual, you as an organization, any organization, direct service, business, a local parent group, sign up to say, we're pro-kid. What does that mean? We want kids prioritized in policy making. That all, that's all it means to sign up. We have 600 organizations already, including major groups like United Way and the Children's Hospital Association, Police Activities League, uh, lots of ethnic-based groups, community-based groups. We're at 600 and we've just gotten started. Imagine when tens of thousands of organizations in this state say, we're pro-kid. And when you drill down, you also see that it's young children who are least likely to visit a dentist. So children that are five and under. So we have 46 dentists that are registered with the state as providing services to dental patients. The problem is we don't know how many of those actually will see children. But in that base, best case scenario, the ratio would be one dentist uh, to 1,450 kids. When we look just at pediatric dentists, so those that we know for sure will see children, we see that in this county there are only three pediatric dentists, which gives us a ratio of one dentist to 22,229 children. What they found in the Adverse Childhood Experiences study was that individuals who were, uh, had four or more adverse childhood experiences were 10 times as likely to become IV drug users. If you have adverse childhood experiences of seven or more, your relative risk of ischemic heart disease, number one killer in the United States, is 360%. But if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, that only mitigates 50% of the risk. So if you have seven or more ACEs, and you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, your relative risk of ischemic heart disease is still almost double someone who had no adverse childhood experiences. Why? Because every time your body releases that adrenaline, it also activates a little bit of inflammation in your immune system. What we found was that if a, if a child had an ACE score of four or more, as, co as compared to someone with zero, their relative risk of overweight or obesity, having a BMI that was 85% or greater, was double. They were twice as likely to be overweight or obese, and um, they were 32 times as likely to have learning or behavior problems in school. But what was critical in this data 
is that for our ACEs score of zero, only 3% of those kids had learning and behavior problems. Only 3% of our black and brown children living in Bayview Hunters Point had learning and behavior problems when their ACEs score is zero. The last 20 years, electronics have become such a prevalence in our youth that basically it ends up being a real problem. They're not outside exercising, they're not outside getting physical, they're getting virtual experiences. Basically what it, these numbers tell us are that uh, compared with normal weight individuals, uh, the uh, odds of developing asthma um, are about two times as high among obese individuals and about 1.4 times as high among overweight individuals. But the good news is, um, in terms of weight loss, 5% loss is clinically significant and it has been proven in numerous studies that that amount of weight loss leads to significant improvements in cardiometabolic uh, risk factors and also reduced risk of uh, heart disease outcomes such as the onset of type 2 diabetes. So that's good news. What are effective interventions? Those effective interventions include uh, mental health work, for children, that mental health work has to be two-generation work. You cannot um, try to do an intervention with a child who's being exposed to trauma without doing something to help their parents. For me, it's uh, deeply upsetting. And when we can do these interventions and say, we were effective after this 12-week or 18-week mindfulness and movement program, we decrease their high sensitivity C-reactive protein. We decrease their cortisol level. We decrease their, all of the, the risk factors for ischemic heart disease. Then we will have folks putting money behind universal screening. We'll get this to be part of the policy agenda. And we will have actual effective intervention for all children. We take care of everybody. You walk through our doors, you get carried through our doors, we will take care of you. Uh, depend, it doesn't depend at all on uh, your ability to pay or any other issues. We, we take care of everybody. And that's a mission that we are dedicated to uh, preserving. Uh, as times have changed, that's been the one thing that we have not changed. What's the future going to hold? What's it going to mean for all of us in this room? What's it going to mean for those of us who work in hospitals, who work in communities, those of us who, who um, work in research and academic medicine. Um, I think the number one thing is it's not going to be the same. I mean, we all know that uh, the spiral of cost for healthcare continues to go up in a way which is untenable. If you look at healthcare outcomes in the United States, uh, they're not as good as you get in many other parts of the country for far less money. So things are going to change. Um, we're going to be needing to look for innovative ways to change care, innovative sorts of interventions, innovative ways that we can partner to keep our patients healthy. Um, and I think that comes back to my plea for looking for partnerships, looking for ways that we can work together, um, comparing or combining the resources that we all have to develop new models, new therapies, new approaches, new ways of thinking, new ways of teaching about pediatric health care. And so they have said in this instance that if indeed uh, you are successful at reducing recidivism, uh, there are savings that the city of New York will be able to pay to MDRC and other investors uh, for the work that they've been doing. However, if they're wildly successful, and reduce the reincarceration rate by 20%, notice that MDRC will actually get a much higher payment. Uh, their net return will be almost two million, a little bit over two million. And for the long-term city net savings, it's 20 million. So there is a reason why social impact investments are getting this much attention. It's because the potential for saving uh, public dollar, if we in, engage private investors, uh, is so high. Yes, we're each pushing our own specific lever, because what schools can do is different than what 
healthcare can do is different what business can do, but if we at least know we're all trying to get to the same place and we're very deliberate about each pushing our own level, levers in a very concerted effort, we can actually see results. When I was on the school board for 10 years, during that time, um, we had a consideration of a soda policy come up. Uh, there was a, a, we were approached by a soda company who said that if, if you put 40 or more uh, vending machines in your, in your uh, school district, we'll be giving you lots of profits and we'll put up a, a playground, uh, a, you know, a scoreboard and it'll be great. And I was actually totally shocked when all the, the school board voted four to one to pass this vending machine policy. When we first started looking at obesity in our community, we found that only a third of the kids that came into the clinic and were obese were actually counseled about that because of that physician cynicism that had gone on. At the best, what you see when you, when you really work closely with a family is that the child stops gaining weight so quickly. That's our best outcome. It's also the norm to have obesity-related uh, environment. I know I, working for Contra Costa Health Plan, I would go give talks to the um, local physicians about obesity, and the health plan would buy sweet rolls and um, <laughs> all kinds of junk food to serve at the talk. And this had been going on forever, and I said, you know, I just feel uncomfortable giving a talk about picking up <laughs> obesity when we're serving junk food. And once you bring up that, people become aware of the fact that, oh yes, every day we have, we have meetings where we sit all day and we never ask to move or exercise. And we are all part of the problem. <laughs> I have actually seen this epidemic come up. I feel like it's been on my watch. <laughs> and it's not right. You know, it's not right for children to grow up in an environment that's unhealthy. I know whenever you go on vacation, you go out and you realize that every coffee shop you you are in is only going to serve you hamburgers and french fries. <laughs> and that it, it's not fair that in order to eat healthy, you have to do something extraordinary. Well, that's what's happening to children in our communities. The norm is to go to the dollar store and drink soda and eat candy because your, your friends do that. And if you didn't do that, you'd be kind of weird. So I, I think we really have to change the medical practice. That's true. We need to identify and counsel kids. But more particularly, we need to change both make available programs to treat kids in the early stages of their obesity, not, not when they're already so tremendously obese that it's become a, a consistent lifestyle. And also we need to prom promote community groups to change the norms in our society. Also I wanted to thank our sponsors. We have Kaiser Permanente, the California Endowment, and First Five of Contra Costa, who really invested a lot of resource and time into helping us pull this together. Mechanics Bank, the City of Richmond, and Comcast, and our support, supporting sponsors, Courtyard Marriott, Genzer and Watkins LLP, the Glenn Price Group, the Kiwanis Club of Richmond, Jack Schrader and Associates, Sims Metal Management, United Way of the Bay Area, and Zell Associates.